Dear students, this is hypopituitarism number two. Hyper, hyperpituitarism number two. And uh, we're going to be talking about um, we're going to be talking about how you establish the diagnosis and what are the treatment options. How do you establish the diagnosis and what are the treatment options? And uh, let's start with the medical diagnosis. Uh, and what we have is multiple data sources, so we have to check a few different places to arrive at the diagnosis. We have labs, we have radiographs or imaging, and we have physical assessment. Physical assessment. Let's hit physical assessment first. Obviously, um, our two major diseases with hyperpituitarism will be acromegaly in the adult, A for adults, if you will, and then um, giganticism for the child. Uh, so in giganticism, obviously, um, we'll see if that came on, uh, if hyperpituitarism arrived when they were young, the onset young or in the early teens, they're going to be very tall. We're talking eight feet tall. So in that case, that's not going to be very difficult to notice from a physical assessment point of view. Okay? That's giganticism. In the adult, um, we won't call it giganticism, we'll call it acromegaly. And this is after the growth plates, remember, have closed in the epiphyseal part of the bone. And so these people, the bones will still grow with acromegaly, have a, they have a distorted appearance. And uh, some of the manifestations will be on the face, um, particularly the mandible going forward, uh, protruding, uh, pro, protruding forward. It, the dentist might be able to spot that. Uh, also, the hands and the feet will be larger, and um, there might be some speech problems. And also, I want to add this. You know, the person with acromegaly, will, initially, they may have, feel strong when they first, uh, first onset of the disease, but later on, what they'll be plagued with their feelings of weakness. That's physical assessment. Uh, radiographs. Let's look at our most detailed image we know is the MRI, the claim to fame. That, you're really going to get a clear detailed representation. Next, we can look at a CAT scan. Um, a CAT scan, and I'll use a water-soluble contrast media, iodine, and um, to evaluate the area. And then also we have x-rays. We have x-rays, and a, a, a routine x-ray should be able to determine that they have an enlarged cella tersica. What is cella tersica? It's a Turkish word, by the way, for um, saddle. And that is a place where the pituitary gland stays, the cella tersica. And that could be enlarged when they have hyperpituitarism. All right, angiography. Uh, in, in case the origin of the problem or etiology of the problem is based on an aneurysm or atrial venous uh, problem, angiography should be able to reveal that. So what do we have? In imaging radiographs, we have uh, x-ray, CAT scan, MRI, and geography. Labs, what about labs? Well, we know that we can measure the um, hormone levels in the blood. Perhaps um, we can think of this special word, radioimmunoassay, radioimmunoassay, and that is an ability to um, gather information from the blood in a laboratory and get precise and accurate numbers of the hormones in the body. Okay, now I put LH and FSH. We know that they come from the pitu uh, anterior pituitary gland. Very rarely do we have a patient who has a problem with this, elevated levels. We know that in postmenopausal women, um, the LH and FSH, that's luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, is um, elevated in postmenopausal women. Um, now, they may do a complete workup where they check all the levels of the anterior pituitary hormones. But for our study here, what we're really going to focus in is on growth hormone and prolactin. Um, so we know that if a person has hyperpituitarism, probably, not probably, what will manifest itself most often will be elevated growth hormone and then elevated, elevated prolactin. But in acromegaly, remember, that's the adult onset of hyperpituitarism right there. The number one test will be glucose tolerance test. Glucose tolerance test. Number one test for, for acromegaly. And what should happen during the test, I mean, uh, this, this can go on for a couple hours, the test, 
the, when the um, patient gets the bolus of glucose, what should happen to the growth hormone, it should go down. The levels of growth hormone should go down. However, if a person has acromegaly, uh, if they start out with high growth hormone levels, guess what? No change. So we have the unhappy face. No change. And that's a confirmation for the disease, what? Acromegaly. What's the number one lab test for acromegaly? Glucose tolerance test. Okay, we went over physical assessment, we went over labs, and then um, uh, physical assessment, labs, and radiographs. Now we're gonna look on the treatment of hyperpituitarism, the treatment. And there's some happiness and some sorrows involved here. Let's take the sorrows first. Skeletal disfigurement. When the bone has grown and been distorted, it's irreversible. And so um, we can encourage, we cannot, in essence, encourage the patient to say, hey, with treatment, this shall change. Let me throw in something, though, uh, dear friends. Let us keep in mind, though, that there are plastic surgeons, and I haven't read anything of how they manage that, but I'm going to keep an open mind on that. I put a happy face over here. Uh, remember in hyperpituitarism what happens? Yes, organomegaly, soft tissues grow. This we can get improvement. We can get improvement with treatment. That's reversible. All right, at least to a degree. Um, our treatment options, folks, medications, radiation, and surgery. The surgical approach, um, they'll do a hypophysectomy. What's a hypophysectomy? That's removal of the pituitary gland. Removal of the pituitary gland. Transphenoidal hypophysectomy is the number one method. And transphenoidal craniotomy is another option. And that's very invasive, and generally speaking, it probably has a very invasive tumor, therefore ne ne necessitating the uh, involvement of that. Um, here we have medications, folks. And the number one medication used to treat hyperpituitarism is sandostatin, otherwise known as octreotide acetate. Let me explain a little bit about sandostatin. There's a... Um, the hypothalamus produces something called somastatin. Somastatin. Somastatin is what prevents the oversecretion of growth hormone. But the half-life, it only lasts for a matter of minutes, so you couldn't use that as a medication, but you can make something like it that will last longer. Hence, they've come up with sandostatin. And this is the restrainer. This is the restrainer. And this restrains, this will restrain the amount of growth hormone being secreted. How, does, how do we do it? It's given sub-Q three times a week. A week. Uh, medicine is very good, but what, what are some of the things we have to concern ourselves with? Uh, pain at the site, uh, drowsiness, headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, orthostatic hypotension, so you have to check the blood pressure, could have edema, colothiasis, colothiasis, which basically means gallstones and also uh, raised in the bl uh, blood sugar level. Uh, it's a lot of side effects, but this, this medication has been proven to be very, very effective in the treatment, okay? Um, we also have parlotal, parlotal, and um, that can be used to, to, to stop the lactation, which will be brought about by excessive prolactin. And it's also used to treat acromegaly. Uh, so with parlotal, we have to watch out for dizziness and orthostatic hypotension. By the way, parlotal uh, will stop lactation in a lactating mom. And um, a couple other medications of use can be um, Dostonex and Semivert. That will also be used um, in the treatment of hyperpituitarism. Radiation therapy, that's effective also. It's a slow process. Sometimes it's used in conjunction with medications. Um, there are some risks, optic nerve damage, and visual defects. Okay, thank you.